met here in Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, Aerojet, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with the organization, is out of uh, Sacramento, California, principally uh, involved in electronics and propulsion systems. I got involved in putting, uh, working with the group here, the uh, National Space Society, and putting together the conference. And when I look at it in terms of its totally encompassing uh, subjects that have been included, it's, it's rather remarkable uh, in terms of uh, the numbers of people that have come here and the total numbers of topics that are being discussed. And uh, what we tried to do in space transportation, uh, first of all, was to give you some realization uh, of how we started out in space transportation, and that was basically uh, the morning session, uh, how we used to make things work. And uh, the thing that we wanted to do following that was to pursue a line of thought that says, how do we go forward and continue to make things work, and what are those things that we need to be working on uh, to ensure that we have continued mutual access to space and affordable access to space. And as you then spin off of that thought, you begin to see the other sessions that are emerging on Friday afternoon and on Saturday and Sunday, talking specifically about uh, the National Aerospace Plane Program, talking specifically about alternate launch concepts to enable uh, access to space, and then getting even more specific on Sunday, talking about those programs that we have ongoing that are somewhat constrained by budgetary resources, but certainly uh, somewhat also constrained by our ability to envision and imagine and conceptualize relative to where we should go and how we should get there. And if you take all of that and package it into one thought, it's basically to ensure that there's adequate communications with you and with the people that are involved in structuring the programs and people involved in budgeting the programs so that there is a continuity of purpose and a continuity of program objectives and so that we can uh, revitalize, if you will, uh, the space program. The space program in total encompassing many aspects of space. Uh, one of the things that I was fortunate to be able to do when I was in Washington is I served on the President's Committee that was uh, set aside at Patel Laboratories in Columbus, Ohio to uh, basically take a look at where we are and where we might need to go with respect to, uh, to space transportation. Space transportation as it relates purely to space, but also to take those technologies and apply them to commercial transportation so that we can fly uh, faster, potentially higher, more affordably. And uh, the work uh, was done and completed and is contained in a, in, a, in a book that was published that uh, talks about high-speed flight. And uh, even as I speak today, uh, and as you sit here today and as we're involved in this conference, uh, the direction that this country is going to assume is, is really not very clear, unfortunately. Uh, high-speed aircraft uh, and uh, the evolution into into space. Certainly with the programs of the SR-71 and the X-15 allowed us to get into hypersonic regions where we had not been before. We learned a tremendous amount and for now more than 20 years we have ceased that research and that work. And not that we have gone to a complete standstill but certainly we have not learned at the rate that we were learning. I think there are many of us that are very dedicated to this, uh, myself included. Uh, we have built uh, a Mach 8 test facility to be able to test engines and parts of systems to Mach 8. And we are building, uh, in conjunction with the government, a Mach 12 test facility. And these are test 
areas that we will be able to explore, the engines and the combustion and the blow dynamics and the heating and the transpiration and, and the cooling of the surfaces. So there's still quite a bit going on, but in the real context of this particular uh, focus was how can we make things happen more rapidly, development on the fast track. And when you look at our system of government, you see the layers of organizations that get involved in the review process of the concept, that get in re review of the budget, and we just don't have an easy mechanism to allow us to do what we used to do rather easily. Uh, we used to be able to do research on high-speed aircraft and we could fix things and do things and build things and today in order to do that it requires a very regimented review process and, a, and approval process. I'm not denying the fact that there is risk involved when you don't go through these very discrete gates of review but it adds a dimension of cost and time to the program that makes it very, very suspect in terms of whether or not it can accomplish the stated objective within the budget within the period of time that we bought into the program. And I'll take the National Aerospace Plane as an example. We started that program under Copper Canyon. It was a classified program in DARPA, moving rapidly, focused on a 65,000 pound airplane that would put us back into hypersonic flight research. That plane, as a result of its involvement with DARPA and NASA and Congress and many other agencies, grew from 65,000 pounds to 350,000 pounds, and we have spent x billions of dollars, and we still don't have anything flying in a research airplane. And while one could criticize the fact that all of this has taken place and we don't have a research airplane to experiment with today, I think we have moved in a technological sense, piece by piece, to a point where it could be integrated. And there is hope that the 5550 program, five years and uh, $5 million and a 50,000, 60,000 pound airplane can in fact go back into the research uh, area that was deemed necessary. So we wanted to be able to or uh, the possibilities of making changes in the way we do things. And it's most unfortunate that one of the very principal thinkers relative to this, uh, Paul Sizz, uh, is still in St. Louis. He's not doing here until later this evening. He will be here tomorrow. He will be in the session tomorrow afternoon. And I would encourage those of you that have an interest in this topic as well as the other topics that will be discussed to attend that session because Paul is definitely a person who thinks beyond the constraints of the system and the architecture that we have imposed on our way of doing business today. And when I look at the, on balance, the performance of our contemporaries in the international marketplace, I see substantial progress that has been made while we have progressed to something that's essentially an undoable program at this time. Congress is not receptive to many of the aspects of the program. Uh, NASA and the Air Force are not comfortable with the various uh, operational requirements that have been levied on the program. So the development is not on a fast track, it's on a slow pace, it's almost at glacial speed. And if you translate that problem to the problem of moving forward to the next generation launch system, whether it's a new launch system, whether it's a space lifter, whatever it is, it must have a committed objective that can be demonstrated that we are meeting those in order to sustain the commitment from the administration and from Congress and from the American people. Those of us that pay the tax that have an interest in space and want to see it continue. So uh, those are just some of my thoughts as we have put together this particular session and the sessions that 
follow this particular session. And uh, you know, I I would like to stand here and apologize profusely for the fact that these gentlemen have not been able to make it. But you have my commitment because I now know where they are that they will be here tomorrow. Uh, we do have, and are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Maribo, Leek Maribo, who is a professor in the mechanical engineering department at the Rensselaer Polytech Institute in Troy, New York. Uh, I was very fortunate to have one of his students uh, working with me at Aerojet when I was in the uh, program management side of our business and uh, found not only a very delightful and uh, excited and very intellectual, but a, a young man that had been schooled in the technologies that were certainly at the cutting edge where we needed to be. And uh, it uh, is always uh, something that you'd like to do is to find a, a student that is excited about today and excited about tomorrow. And uh, uh, Dr. Marilo just got in at the airport, and uh, I think he uh, was changing clothes as I spoke uh, to you earlier, but I convinced him to come on in and talk to you anyway. Uh, he wanted to go put on a coat, and I told him it wasn't necessary. So, Leek, if you could uh, come up and uh, engage us in some conversation, it would be greatly appreciated. And uh, the, the process tomorrow afternoon will expand on the agenda that you have in front of you to include some of those that are not here today. We, Dennis Wingo, a student at UAH is in Washington. Uh, he was called up there. So we had some very unfortunate situations, but uh, we're also very fortunate to have Dr. Merrill here. All right, well, I was expecting to talk to Mark. So I just got off the airplane and walked in here and uh, said come on now. Heard that. Now, um, I have a short CNN segment here that uh, tells a little bit about my efforts. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay, all right. Um, I've just started a new project uh, under sponsorship of the uh, Space Studies Institute at Princeton to develop concepts and technology for advanced ways of getting to orbit uh, flying uh, on an energy beam. And uh, in the past, I've been working on laser uh, power. Uh, most recently, I'm working on the microwave uh, end of the spectrum uh, because SSI believes that this is the, uh, the short track to high power, and for no other reason. Because the big lasers that I've been waiting for aren't here yet. Is this all Children 
uh, who watch the Saturday morning cartoons and they assume that we're making this technology for them. Because they've all got them, right? Just jump in and go to space or any place on the planet they want to, anytime they want to. Okay. Um, primary focus here, carry out full-scale engine experiments. These are segments. So we're not talking about minuscule levitation of pieces of cigarette foil, you know, paper with a uh, pulse beam. We're talking about big lasers, uh, pulse power. Uh, and finally, bringing lightcraft technology to hardware reality. Okay, so I'm looking for a vision of the future. And dim the front lights yeah. here a little bit. The upbeat vision of the future that I've got in mind for advanced uh, space propulsion is single-stage spacecraft. Well, we all know that that's uh, a good thing to look for. Ultra-energetic propulsion. We're talking about specific impulses here that are not 500 seconds. We're talking 1,000, 10,000, maybe 20,000 seconds. This would be nice to have. High specific impulse. And uh, high Gs if we want it. We've got uh, two protection <coughs> systems, advanced G-suits or whatever that allow tens of Gs. Instead of three Gs, we can, uh, we can really cut down the exposure uh, time that you've got to the risky boost portion of the space flight. Emergency ejection pods. How about a system you can get out of when you're in trouble? Even when you're at orbit velocity at 180,000 feet, punch out, you know, re-enter, come down, land safely. All right, this would be nice to have. I talked about the high survivability G suit. You know, it'd be nice to have something like that. Maybe liquid filled, maybe pressurized, and a payload fraction. How about a payload fraction of 10 or 20 percent? All right, something large. The mission. Mission focus I'd like to uh, look at today, Earth to orbit. Uh, Earth to orbit and return. Direct Earth to moon. Not impossible, I think we'll see. Go to escape velocity directly. Well, if you've got high specific impulse, you can do that. These missions don't become impossible. Uh, Mars orbit to surface and return. And of course, suborbital hypersonic transatmospheric vehicle flight. Uh, being able to take off from Huntsville, Alabama, and being anywhere in the world in 45 minutes or less. That would be a great technology to have. Well, under S, uh, on the Strategic Defense Initiative uh, support, we could dim this a little bit more, too, if you, uh, if you like. You could see some of these color pictures a little better. This is a conceptual uh, design for a ground-based laser-boosted shuttlecraft about one meter in diameter. Might also work on millimeter wave power, possibly microwave power. The goal here is to push something into orbit uh, with a ground-based power beam system. Uh, this vehicle uh, was designed to fly with propellant being liquid air, liquid nitrogen. Uh, possibly liquid hydrogen for a lightweight version of this. And we worked out a complete uh, uh, engine system for this vehicle. Started out air breathing and went into rocket. For the human element, under sponsorship of uh, NASA and various parts of this technology, we had some Air Force uh, help, SDI help. We developed a uh, what we call the Mercury light craft, which was laser boosted from a space-based system that presumably would run on solar power. Uh, these vehicles would be pre-programmed prior to launch. Uh, very little uh, active you know, human control would be necessary once you've plugged in your destination, put in your credit card, and uh, beamed up. So the uh, engine uh, for liftoff is a pulse detonation engine. We actually did a full-scale segment uh, experiment of that engine at uh, Naval Research Laboratory. Here's a picture of the target chamber, lenses, and whatnot. We used a, a laser that was designed for fusion. It was at one micron wavelength. We measured performance uh, of that, this engine to be roughly equal to one of the first uh, turbojets. 
200 newtons of thrust per megawatt of laser power. This isn't a pipe dream. You can actually do full-scale experiments with existing lasers on the Now, they don't have the time average power, but they've got the peak power for one or two pulses. You can do a great experiment and really get good data. Now, how energetic are we talking about? Well, this laser light craft, one person, maybe 75 kilograms weight uh, mass, I mean, for the person. Uh, we're talking about a liftoff gross weight for the vehicle of like 700 kilograms. What does that work out to uh, for horsepower? Uh, 700,000 horsepower. Well, the beam comes from someplace else. So you don't have to carry this kind of power on board. If there's a problem, shut off the beam. No explosion. Uh, we're talking about spacecraft that uh, have a, uh, an energy density of 450 horsepower per pound. Every pound of that spacecraft basically contributes 450 horsepower. These are phenomenally uh, powerful vehicles. We've also done some work here, most recently under SSI sponsorship, trying to develop what, what would this microwave light craft look like. And we're thinking, well, it's going to have to be big to deflect the power because microwave power, uh, well, you got to have it less dense than laser power in a given volume of space. We'll talk about that later. So we're talking about half the weight, basically, for a microwave system and 10 meters in diameter instead of two and a half. But phenomenally energetic system. So when I was approached by SSI uh, to to dream up a concept for a microwave-propelled spacecraft, uh, I was thinking, God, this is really out there, even further than the laser systems, because you can get you can get a 200 megawatt beam, you know, about 10 inch diameter. All right, you get a bunch of those around a circle. You can put easily a billion watts of laser power into a small vehicle, a couple meters in diameter. But with microwave power, the receiving antenna is going to have to be meters, you know, in diameter. So I got to thinking, well, it's going to have to be big, it's going to have to be light, and then it, then it hit me. <laughs> okay, hypersonic blimp. Now, what, I, what I like about this picture here is this artist got a little carried away, but I mean, this blimp really wants to get there. It really wants to go. I mean, it's, it's all tensed up. It's ready for flight. Okay, So keep that in mind, because pretensioning I think of a structure like this is very important. So I pulled out some of the old airship reports, and what do we have? Well, we got balloons. We got the aero stacks. We just meant to hang in the air. We're all familiar with these. We've seen uh, the Goodyear blimp flying around. It's a non-rigid. It's a pressure airship. It's got a little bit of positive pressure inside to keep the envelope punched out. All right, inflated. You take this blimp faster than 100 miles an hour, the front end caves in from the pressure, the dynamic pressure. It's not designed to go faster than 100 miles an hour. The propulsion system itself, a couple hundred horsepower, won't push it faster than 100 miles, so there's no 100 mile an hour. So there's no problem unless it's going to die or just carry it away. And you got to watch it. Um, we also have these semi-rigids that have some rigid structural interior members, and uh, you know, the Hindenburg we're familiar with. Uh, metal clad. The, uh, the Navy came up with a thin uh, aluminum, you know, kind of system, pressure airship. There are also the hybrids, lenticular rigids, deltoid rigids, heavy lift non-rigids. So I like to think in terms of blimp, you know, or airship, uh, balloon, if you will. But it's going to have to be a very special balloon. Now, if you take a cutaway look at a Goodyear blimp, or one of these uh, inflatables, pressure airships, you see that there are catenary curtains sewn in between the doors of the blimp, all right? And these little curtains allow you to suspend heavier components uh, inside, like the crew pod, for example. So you can hang significantly a massive components relative to the mass of the whole rest of the thing on these things uh, and get them to hang together, but you've got to use special techniques. One thing I want to point out about all the advanced uh, composites that we've been developing lately, the carbon fiber, the carbon, they're fantastic in tension. You know, get a fiber, pull on it. I mean, it's just great. Try to push on it. You know, what do you get? 
like pushing on a hair. All right, they're great intention, they're poor on compression, so why not design aerospace vehicles to be tensile structures? And then pre-tension them prior to flight so that the dynamic pressure of the air and the propulsion forces doesn't cave it in. It just lessens the amount of tensioning in the direction of flight. So that's, that's the uh, model that I'm thinking about here. So, uh, what I'm going to tell you about here is just one of the many possibilities for microwave light craft. Power rich, all right, mass four. Mass is the enemy, so keep the mass light, get high performance. Hyper energetic, puts lots of power in it, 400, 700,000 horsepower. With the beam you can do that. Make it non-rigid, pressure airship, inflate it with two atmospheres of helium, that's our point design. So inside it's got two atmospheres, outside is one atmosphere, so the differential is one atmosphere across that thin skin It's designed to handle it. Uh, make it uh, neutrally buoyant at sea level or partially buoyant. Okay? So you don't have to bring it down to the ground, you, know, you could go up to it, keep it moored at altitude like the blimp. Uh, lenticular or oblate spheroid shape, we're looking at fineness ratios and that's diameter to height, the two, two to one to three to one. Forget about fins or aerodynamic control surfaces. With this kind of power, you don't need them. You can use active thrust vectoring like the, like the Harrier jump jet. Um, so they'll rip off in hypersonic flight anyway. You can't support uh, a fin like that very well. So what do we got? Okay, let's take, take a sphere and squash it. All right, we got a lens. Now, the lens is not gonna be stable by itself. Fill out full of two atmospheres of helium, it goes in and tries to go into a sphere. Can't do it. So let's put a toroid, an inner tube around the outside of it, and we're going to put in like 30 to 50 atmospheres of hydrogen. Okay, we're going to use propellant hydrogen in a gaseous state, not a liquid. We're going to use gaseous uh, hydrogen, okay, around the outside. Now it's going to have to be a special uh, material. Now, we've developed here lately vapor deposited diamond thin films. All right, this is an advanced form of carbon. Eventually, we'll get monolayers that are as strong as car our best carbon filaments. And they're transparent. Diamond is transparent from infrared all the way to visible uh, wavelengths of light. So let's make that a window. Now, add some antennas in the inside. So here's a parabolic antenna. Bring down the power beam, focus it out the window. You get the right intensity at the focus, it'll break down the air and create an explosion in air, a detonation. All right? Well, you get thrust from that, lots of it, as I'll point out shortly here. Now, you may also need other internal uh, power conversion systems. Uh, you may not want the power in the form of a microwave beam or a millimeter wave beam. You might want it as electric power in some of the advanced uh, engine motors and the hypersonic. So, there may have to be additional concentric antennas here that do interesting things. Like the center one here would uh, bounce off a primary optic onto a secondary and into a power converter a dynamic system, maybe a microwave heated rocket with an MHD generator on it. And let's also add some uh, superconductors in here that will help us tension the structure. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And let's make the antennas so that they're deformable, actively controlled. But you can bounce the microwave power or millimeter wave power out ahead of the vehicle or any place you want to, uh, for reasons I'll explain shortly. So what we're talking about is a vehicle with an extremely smooth outer surface. Why? Because if there's any little hairs on it from your fiber, you'll break down the microwave power beam and it'll act like an antenna. Uh, advanced tensile structures. How about, uh, and I mentioned this, spin stabilizing the platform so it always points at the power beam, all right? Because you're going to have to have alignment within a degree or so. <coughs> Otherwise, you won't get good focusing out of your parabolic antenna. So spin <coughs> stabilize. Uh, also, if you're spinning the propellant out here, you've got a big gyroscope, all right? And that will help pre-tension the structure as well as these magnets. Put the, uh, mic, put the antennas inside so they're not subject to the external aerodynamic and propulsion loads. 
And let's look at, at a combined cycle um, engine, an advanced engine. Here's a design for an antenna. Microwave millimeter uh, wave antennas, they don't have to be continuous sheets, they can be a mesh. As long as the mesh size is less than a tenth of a wavelength. And with smart structure technology, actuators, you can tension up the back side of this uh, and get any contour you want, actively controlling. This is comp computationally intensive here. We need massive computation of the whole structure itself. Okay, a point design. One person to orbit. Okay, here's the Atlas rocket. Used for the Mercury mission. One person to orbit. Take a microwave light craft, 10 meters in diameter. This is relative size of it. This is the size of the payload. So we're talking balloons here still. But they don't weigh anything. Here's a cross-sectional view of a couple alternatives showing the toroidal fuel tank and everything on it. The total weight of the structure for the upper and lower skin is like 40 kilograms. Why? Because it's a couple tenths of a millimeter thick, that's why. But it's strong, believe me, it is very strong in tension. There are other problems that we'll talk about shortly. This isn't the only uh, possibility. There are other shapes too that may be useful. Uh, nested toroids with vertical curtains inside. All this stuff was worked out in the 70s by the architects who were building domes over tennis courts. Buckminster Fuller, geodesic domes, you know, remember back then in the 70s. Tensile structures, these were worked out back then. They didn't have the uh, advanced carbon fiber that we have today or the diamond, all right? But they worked out the details. So just a cross-sectional view of this machine, uh, one of them, We've got a, a dome on top, an interior antenna, uh, another antenna here, tertiary antenna out here I'll talk about shortly. This is the fuel tank. Uh, that's basically the layout of it. Smart structures. All right. If this thing isn't going to weigh anything, it's going to certainly have to know how it's doing. Every split second on the way to, to orbit. So we got massive parallel processing computing. Uh, energy and intelligence is substituted for vehicle mass. Mass is the enemy. Intelligence is getting cheap and pretty light. All right? uh, massive onboard computing, I talked about that. Numerous onboard load sensors and actuators. The whole skin is covered with pressure transducers, heat transfer gauges, uh, stress gauges. Uh, electrical uh, voltage, uh, uh, you know, measuring electrical stresses. Uh, aerodynamic propulsion and inertial acceleration loads are actively compensated for how by tensing the structure, bracing it prior to a, performing a maneuver. And those loads just reduce the pre-stressed uh, levels. Okay. Centripetal spin rate uh, forces and magnetic forces from self-magnetic fields and superconductors. We're talking big fields here at the rim. We're talking a couple Tesla. All right, that's 10,000 to 20,000 boss. We're sitting at a half a boss right now on the Earth field. So these are big, but they're no bigger than what you get scanned with in the hospital. The nuclear magnetic resonance imaging machine, those are one or two Tesla. They'll stop your watch, you know. You don't want to bring any steel in there because it'll fly like crazy. But uh, okay, and the hull of the exterior structure must be non-magnetic, magnetic, and uh, dielectric. So let, let me show you an example of a very simple engine. I'm calling this the microwave pulse detonation engine. Now, to really get a detonation with the microwave wavelengths, you're going to have to be like sub millimeter, unless you do some special things with the magnetic field. But Bring the beam down, bounce, bounce it off the primary optic, focus it out through this window, break down the air, which it does very easily, and we get an expanding air pulse. Well, what's interesting here is this plasma that's created, swarming you know, electrons and ions, wants to go out the nozzle made by these two magnets that are facing each other. Uh, and air will come across, you know, it's a non-conducting. Uh, it moves across the field lines very easily. So we might get a pulse plasma here and a refresh very quickly. 
laterally around the vehicle. And, oh, one thing to point out, notice that there is a magnetic field coil here, upper and lower. If you want to deflect the, thr the thrust here to maneuver, put a bigger field on the upper magnet, run more current through it, and you'll deflect it. So here shows the location of two primary magnetic field coils and the second ones, which are used for propulsion. Okay, so we can use thrust vectoring for actively uh, maneuvering, deflecting the exhaust, we can steer the exhaust, uh, you can reduce heat transfer, there's no nozzle, you know, it's magnetic. There's a magnetic field here, so you cut down heat transfer from, the, from this high temperature plasma, promotes refresh, and uh, you can direct the exhaust wherever you want. We did some calculations on this engine. This is kind of a complicated table, but I'll just pick out a typical number. Uh, sea level, uh, 1,200 pulses per second. I don't know, is anybody a pianist here? That's, I think this little C here or something. Anybody know? I think this little C, or thereabouts. Uh, that's at sea level. We're talking about 600,000 newtons of thrust. This thing only weighs 350 kilograms. So how many Gs is that? Look out to be. Well, it's over 150. 150 Gs. Okay, so you're going to need some pretty fancy uh, acceleration protection suits uh, for you know, a manned vehicle here. Now, yeah, you can cut down the pulse repetition frequency uh, by a factor of 10 if you want, or more, and just pulse slower. You can do that. But uh, if you want to get out of a spacecraft, it may turn out that you want to have a special G protection suit uh, where you can get out of it. The Shuttle Challenger accident, uh, during the explosion, uh, the astronauts were subjected to something like 15 or 18 G. That's nothing. It's an impulsive load. They easily survived that. They're strapped to their suits, right? They took the G vector in, in a certain correct direction you know, through the stomach, if they did. Uh, they died when they hit the uh, seawater, 200 G. It was an impulsive load. But there are systems right now that have been developed uh, for liquid-filled G suits. The Air Force is experimenting, experimenting with one right now, the Atlantis Warrior. Uh, there have been experiments uh, done on animals, uh, liquid-filled lungs, liquid fluorocarbons. Anybody see abyss? Okay. These animals can be spun up in a centrifuge at 100 Gs or more, a couple hundred Gs, with no problem. You just stop and take them out, and they you know, cough up the fluorocarbons, and they just scamper off. So you know, we can develop these kind of systems. You can get out of a spacecraft that's in severe trouble with the right kind of protection and a certain kind of pod. Now, kind of the major problem here, this thing is a balloon. How are you going to make it go supersonic, for Pete's sakes? Well, even with this 100, uh, what was it, 160 Gs uh, force I talked about when it's standing still, it's limited to Mach 2 because it's a huge bow shock that you'd be pushing out ahead of it. It's a blunt body. It's a balloon, for God's sake. You know, you're not going to take it very fast. There's limits to the aerodynamics here. If we could manipulate the aerodynamics on the vehicle and change that blunt front end to a sharp wedge, you could go a lot faster. You could go hypersonic very quickly. So how can we do that? Well, maybe we can beam microwave or laser power ahead of the vehicle, pry open the atmosphere. You know, you could cut vehicle drag coefficients by 10 to 30 times by doing that. And uh, this could also become an efficient hypersonic inlet for an air-breathing engine. So here's, here's the picture. Upside down. Upside down. No one. One. Okay. Here we are. So we're trying to go fast. We want to go Mach 2. We want that huge thrust, uh, pulse detonation engine. If we can beam power ahead and do this, create a detached leak shock, drag coefficients go down by 10 to 30 times. Don't you use a lot of energy to create that up front? Yes, uh, but let me point out that this vehicle is capable of taking in a billion watts of power. It might take you a tenth of that to uh, clean up the aerodynamics. It's a good investment. Done some some numbers on this, and yeah, we're talking maybe a tenth of the power this thing could take to clean up the aerodynamics. So 
what do we do? Well, we, we focus the, uh, the beam here out ahead of the vehicle, either rapidly pulsed or continuously on all the time, and it will be pry open the atmosphere. It doesn't look exactly like a wedge, you know, but uh, this, this can be worked. This can be done. Our SDI experiments prove that. Okay, I'm not going to go down and tell you all the different uh, propulsion systems, but we've worked on, uh, on several. Uh, the critical engine to get into orbit is uh, MHD uh, on this machine, magnetohydrodynamics. And uh, it is possible also to uh, create a plasma spike you know, in the vertical direction, like the plasma wedge moving horizontally. And the object here would be to accelerate the atmosphere just around the edges of the vehicle. It's a conducting plasma here. And uh, the magnetic field is very high in the rim here. You set the superconductors right. Send electric power through that, and you've got a thruster. How is that done? For those of you who studied uh, MHD, uh, here's the cross-sectional view cut through the vehicle, the pie-shaped piece of it, showing the fuel tank, this elliptical shape, a couple of electrodes. The idea is to take this dashed line, send electric power from electrode to electrode around the rim. The magnetic field is out vertically, out through the rim. All right? And if you just use your right hand rule, uh, current crossing the magnetic field gives you the direction of thrust, which is down. All right? You can eliminate this bow shock altogether. Put enough power down there, we pump out the high pressure behind that shock wave, the shock wave will disappear. It will be gone. So if environmentalists would like this, standpoint of low noise in the hypersonic uh, regime. How do you get the power? Well, you're going to need lots of it. We're talking about several hundred megawatts electric. That core portion of the uh, antenna system I told you about in the center, take in microwave power, millimeter wave power into a, through a window, create a plasma and hydrogen running from the fuel tank, out through a, a rocket-driven MHD generator, pull out electric power, maybe 50% of what you put in in microwave power, maybe more efficient. And use that electric power to accelerate here. So that's, that's how that engine works. Okay, almost done here. Uh, now one thing you're going to say is, this thing's going to melt. You're trying to, put, you're trying to put a balloon that has a couple millimeters thick skin at hypersonic velocities through the atmosphere. The atmospheric friction is just going to destroy it. Mountain. Well, maybe not. Um, clearly, thermal management is a big issue here. We can all agree on that. Um, we're going to have thermal management problems with this energy conversion system I told you about. But we've got gaseous hydrogen in here um, as a coolant. We might have to carry some extra coolant, like water, maybe. Uh, but realize that uh, this vehicle with G protection on a pilot is capable of some very high uh, maneuvers. The duration of acceleration might be very short. We're talking about a minute, maybe two minutes to get to orbit, velocities. Um, so it's that thermal pulse I want you to think about. And this kind of a machine has some peculiar properties. Most of today's radiation protection systems are like the shuttle. Our shell tiles we've all heard about. The radiation from the air, from the atmospheric friction, uh, is absorbed on the tiles and then re-radiated. Well, how about if we had a transparent envelope? Heck, you know, let it go through. Let a large portion of the infrared and visible radiation from the friction go through. Uh, we already talked about cleaning up the aerodynamics, so we got a sharp point on here. And so a lot of the hot, uh, a very hot plasma is, is some distance from the vehicle. So I'll push it away. Spin the vehicle. When the front end heats up, bring it to the back and let it cool off. So a rotating radiator concept. Uh, we have also a lot of onboard helium uh, circulated through a double hull. So it's a dynamic cooling system to cool the airframe at the front end where you need it. So there's a lot of thermal mass on board. Let it heat up on the way to orbit. Let it cool off uh, in space. Some things to think about.
about uh, in the thermal management. Okay, uh, I could go on to the other engine uh, concepts, but I really want to wrap up here. Like I think I've taken more than my time. Um, tell you what the ultimate objective of this SSI light track project is. They want to fund a series of experiments more on laser propulsion and also initial ones on microwave propulsion. And I've only been able to find um, in the literature one test which was classified as now unclassified on microwave uh, pulse jets basically. You could interpret them that way. Only one experiment in the last, uh, well since SDI started. Once we get these uh, proof of concept experiments done and to start designing some uh, concept vehicles, uh, maybe a small launch facility for very small payloads initially, um, we can do something. So we want uh, SSI, I uh, would like to uh, form a strategic partnership, government industry, financial community, academia, uh, to enhance the access to multidisciplinary uh, technical expertise. This vehicle, like every other aerospace vehicle, uh, has some great challenges, and many of them are systems integration issues. You can engineer these systems. You can do numbers on all of this. Um, I have a, a Soviet scientist uh, who's an expert in laser plasma physics uh, sent over here from uh, Moscow to work with me uh, this next six weeks, uh, actually doing the detailed design of this plasma uh, spike and wedge inlet. See how well it would uh, integrate for drag reduction and for hypersonic air breathing propulsion. Good grief, think of it. If the NASP could get rid of that long nose, all right, and all the weight of that nose, and the problem of having keeping it cool, well, it needs a lot of propellant. You know? If we could get rid of the propellant, all right, it doesn't need that fuel tank and that great big nose and replace it with just the expenditure of some energy. Now, now we're getting to the point where the mass shrinks down to a little, little number, all right, relative to systems today. Very different regime. So I talked about the proof of concept experiments. Uh, we want to actually create a small launch facility with microwave or millimeter wave power, a demonstrator, ground-based system, boosted to orbit, use active tractor phased arrays. And this technology exists. If you want uh, hundreds of megawatts of microwave power, millimeter wave power, well, gang, in, gang together enough gyrotrons, you know, and sophisticated control systems. You can build these systems right now. It's just like a big phased array, you know, over the horizon, right, uh, radar system. And build a uh, low cost uh, energy beam highway to space. That's what we like to do. So that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's time. Yeah, we've got a few minutes here. Can we turn the lights on back there? Surely there must be a question. Yeah. Are the test Tesla magnets available? Yeah, I think five Tesla or more are available. Uh, what do the magnets look like? Well, we're talking about, believe it or not, a one centimeter diameter cable, all right, with about five centimeters of insulation and kind of a rigid housing around it, you know, carbon fiber tube, chloride, all right, and the insulation is just a space blanket material, all right, it doesn't weigh anything, maybe five percent, if I add a five percent weight number, and then down the center of this uh, uh, niobium titanium conventional material, uh, today, we can build the design, is some liquid helium. Now, keeping it cool for a couple minutes or a 45 minute flight or whatever is not a hassle because uh, you're talking about uh, evaporating a little bit of helium. But we're talking milliliters per day. So, if you boil out a little helium, you got a tank on board, liquid helium, just dump it into the envelope. Because there'll be some small leaks in that uh, balloon anyway. Structure has to be because it seems to be there's a problem with that. It just 
thing that's a collapsing itself. Okay. Um, the structural issue of maintaining the geometry of that magnet is crucial. It's very important. The uh, failure mode, however, will be that it tries to go like this around the outside. So it has to be very carefully braced and controlled. It is a critical issue. I don't want to play it down. Uh, but if you turn on a magnet, what it tries to do is blow itself apart. It has a high field in the center, lower field outside. So that magnetic pressure tries to tension it. It doesn't collapse inward. It tries to blow itself out. It tries to keep. My error. Huh? My error. Oh, yeah. yeah. It tries to keep extended. We're using that to tension the structure. Has anyone built one of these very lightweight superconducting magnets? Most of the ones I've seen. Most superconducting magnets I've seen have the iodine titanium inside of copper and then that's put on steel frames or non-magnetic stainless steel frames so they want to avoid magnetic effects and you wind up with something that generally weighs a huge, a huge amount and I think it'd be just a neat trick to just build, just see the, just see the magnet, the space blanket and everything like that would be enough of a trick that I'd pay for admission. Yeah, well, uh, that's a good point and uh, most of these magnets haven't had to fly. Yeah, uh, it's like the Wright brothers developing a new engine, you know, and it had to, it had to, you know, pinch uh, the mass, you know, down as small as it could. But um, there have been a lot of studies uh, looking at lightweight superconductors for uh, magnetic uh, interaction with the uh, solar wind, MagSail. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Zubrin, and also for uh, magnetic attentioning uh, solar collectors. All right, this is a new idea of mine. You know, people have looked at this before, and uh, yeah, it turns out that the weight of these magnets is limited by the bracing to keep them from blowing apart. It's niobium titanium; it's a little bit brittle, you know, and it doesn't like to stretch. You know, it pulls apart. But if the, these can be wrapped with filaments of uh, carbon fiber, you know, they'll stay intact. So yeah, these things can be built. You know, it's just. The weight goes down to the weight of the fiber. Yes, in the back. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that there would be a need for some uh, massive information processing. Yeah. I think you were alluding to uh, parallel processing conflict of some sort. Maybe. It's not massive enough. It's a single process. Well, yeah. That, that was one of my questions. That makes sense. Yeah. What functions do you envision this uh, being carried out from an information processing point of view? Okay, well, consider that the whole flight uh, is going to be pre programmed. Okay, the pilot will. If you're military police, you'll select your mission. Okay. If you're civilian like us, most of us anyway in this room, uh, you, you fly point to point. You know, you pay for your ride. All right. Uh, but assume it's military. Okay. You want to go point to point to maneuver. Uh, it's pre-programmed, pre-processed. Uh, the envelope uh, drives the engine to perform along that trajectory. Uh, all the sensors on the vehicle are monitoring to find out how I'm doing this microsecond or millisecond. Uh, oops, <laughs> you know, uh, just hit a uh, gall or something. Uh, you know, it has the hull fracture. You know, do I have a hull rupture? Uh, does the pilot have to punch out? All right, all these decisions are being made in sub millisecond uh, time frames. All right, you don't consciously have capability of deciding, oh, my spacecraft has exploded. You know? uh, so it's all going to be pre-processed. Can I answer your question? Yes, but is another it? Another person, go ahead. I'll get back. Anybody else in the back? Yeah, over here. You talked about one, uh, one, uh, one paper on microwave power from the evening. Yeah, uh, microwave impulse generation on the surface. Okay. Is there, is there any more research being done in that area? No. Not to my knowledge, this is classified. I think the SDI is not interested because it's not good. Microwave power is not good for you know, punching holes in aluminum. Uh, it's no good. You, know, uh, you light up a plasma above the surface and protects itself. This is great. Well, the maximum range of the power of OT. Okay, the, the good question. Um, if you're going to beam over long ranges, unless your antenna size is mega, the shorter wavelength you can pick the better. But yeah, you can't uh, defeat Mother Nature. You've got to go through the calculations, figure out your wavelength, how big your antenna is, and play the game right. Yeah. 
that means that's a critical question. If you fail a large side and it at various locations, the electronic test there. The electronic test there is being from uh, several football fields uh, and on the ground. You want to pass off the light crap to other antennas, you can do that. Or go space space, have the antenna flying over, the power's up there, you just beam down and track the light crap and mate with it in orbit or pass it on beyond. Thank you for being here and thank you, Dr. Merlot. 